So the next item, item number two, as I mentioned, is a DEI Group 1 Community Awareness and Community Building Recommendations. Before I turn it over to our Group 1, I want to kind of provide a little bit of background for people watching and for the community at large. Um, our, this is the very first time that the Mount Lebanon resident DEI initiatives are all coming together and presenting their initial recommendations to the commission, to the entire commission. This is a very important moment for the municipality of Mount Lebanon. Um, I wanna set the stage for this work by paying tribute to some of those that came before us. To those who first shaped and tended our land, planted the tree species we enjoy today, to those who created and sustained our homes of worship, and to those who founded our local government as we know it today. I'll open by paying honor and respect to the first settlers in Mount Lebanon long before it was Mount Lebanon, our First Nations people, the Osage and the Shawnee peoples. The Osage and Shawnee were on this land for over 10,000 years and were the predominant inhabitants of this land until the 1800s. There were approximately 1 million Native, Amer Native people living on what is now the United States in the 1600s, and there are approximately 1 million Native people living in the United States today. Their story is one of incredible resilience. Next, I want to pay honor and respect to the first Western communities that were established on this land in the 1800s. Those communities centered around places of worship. The Mount Lebanon United Presbyterian Church was the only church in the area for 72 years, and this church served as the primary social center, spiritual center, and community support network for our area in the 1800s. In the 1850s, Reverend Joseph Clokey with the Mount Lebanon United Presbyterian Church brought back two Cedar of Lebanon trees from the Republic of the Lebanon area and planted them near the church, which influenced our municipality's name. The first post office was established in 1855 with our name of Mount Lebanon. And Mount Lebanon was established as a separate township in 1912, primarily because the people living here desired the installation of a sewer system, street lighting, and other amenities. Some of our ancestors here in Mount Lebanon were forcibly taken to the United States as slaves. Some of our ancestors fled, escaping religious persecution or famine. Some of our neighbors have moved here recently from other states or another country, and some are moving here today that are still fleeing persecution across the globe. Through acknowledging and honoring our individual and collective ancestors, traditions, our histories, our ways of worship, our ableness, our identities, we grow richer and stronger as a community. It's through this work that my hope is that we can individually and collectively reflect upon our diverse identities and emerge a more united community. There were four areas that the commission um, has required assistance from our residents in this year. From the initial year of research, we hope to gain a better understanding of what structure and entity would be optimal to support this work long-term. So I'll um, briefly mention the four areas that we're focused on in 2021, and then I'll turn it over to um, group one. The four areas are community awareness and community building. Group That's group one. Group two is hiring. Group three is police engagement. And group four is DEI recognition, event planning, and incident response. Um, it was based on the based on how the recommendations were coming in that we organized the presentations today, such that group one community awareness would be presenting in the same public discussion as group four incident response, because there was a lot of overlap with regards to some of the recommendations, especially around events. Um, at our next public commission discussion session, which is on October 26th, we'll hear from group two and group three. Those are the hiring and police engagement groups, and they also had some overlap in their recommendations with regard to hiring. Um, I'm not sure if the other commissioners want to add anything. Yeah, just real quick. Your time. Okay. So I just wanted to highlight for those in the room, which is pretty much the guy groups, <laughs> and those who might be watching at home. Um, this was a very long process and, and speaking to some of the groups and attending some of the group meetings, it was really great to see some of the recommendations that were being created. I've had an opportunity to check in on the work of pretty much all the groups now. Uh, and I've worked closely with, with the police engagement working group, uh, group three. So I, I just wanted to highlight two commissioners in particular, um, Mindy and Leanne, who really spent a lot of time. I mean, we, we're talking about four groups that have been meeting for almost a year now hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours on meetings and fact-finding and research. That's a lot of time. 
and a lot of work to go in for residents. They're not being paid for this. Right. You know, they're they're putting all this work together to make our community better. So I really appreciate that. And I did want to call attention to, to Mindy and Leanne's work because it was instrumental in the beginning in, in setting this up, going through the uh, interview process, making sure that uh, the boards were created fairly, and, and we have very diverse boards, which is fantastic. And I think we're all really excited, I think I can speak for the commission, to hear the recommendations that we're going to hear tonight and, and also at, at the next meeting. But, uh, and I also wanted to uh, thank the staff because we had a lot of staff acting as liaisons to these groups, and um, we had a lot of staff time. Uh, you know, this was above and beyond their, their jobs, uh, and a lot of stuff, you know, at night over the weekends and putting together a lot of different material and keeping everything organized. So appreciate the, the work that staff has done on this as well. So uh, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just specifically recognize some of the staff and I'll probably miss someone, but I know that Laura Pace Lilly has spent countless hours with two of our groups and then helped with other groups. So that's been amazing. And Ian has also been of assistance, um, particularly to group two, but also just providing a PowerPoint format to think about in terms of the work of each group. Um, Bonnie from our HR department helped with group two, Chief Locke with group three, and of course Robin and the library staff have been really helpful to group one, but I know they've been helpful to the other groups as well. So thank you so much um, for all of that work. And Katie Wagner with the yes. BIO group, and then yes. two police officers as well mm -hmm. that were on the police engagement working group um, as police liaisons. Um, all right, and with that, um, so I know we took up a couple minutes of your time, and we can we can bleed over if we need to, but I'd like to turn it over to Group One. Um, if you want to come up and present, you can. If you might be more comfortable because you have a desk, or you're welcome to stay there if that's easier for you as well. Um, sure. Great. Thank you, everybody. Let me put the screen share. If you can speak loudly, it helps anybody who's being at home. So just don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I want to echo all the appreciation that everybody else uh, has said. We very much appreciate a guided through all this work. Put it on the table. Um, yeah. Great goals. Um, you. The, um, so our recommendation here uh, today is for the community climate survey. And what that is, is it's a survey that really gauges the perception of residents of Mount Lebanon and people interacting in Mount Lebanon and focuses primarily on hearing from underrepresented groups in our community. That's been one of the hallmarks of this survey that we really want to stress is that the voices of people who may not have been historically welcome in Mount Lebanon are the voices we really need to hear from. And that needs to be at the center of this survey. Yes, we want to hear from everybody, but we, we want to make sure that we have people that are conducting this survey that, is, that are able to ensure that those are voices are heard. We also want this survey to be actionable and repeatable. It's very important that there are actual outcomes that can come from this, that we can actually uh, act upon whatever the results of the survey are. And we want to be able to make it repeatable in that uh, our recommendation is that every three years we conduct this survey so we have, um, so we can uh, gauge how the community has changed, how it's shifted, and how we need to shift as a municipality. So one of the key parts of that is hiring the uh, consultant to conduct the survey. Um, and we'll, along with that, we recommend hiring a, or bringing along a working group of people who have been both uh, part of the process of developing the survey and other opening it to other residents who may have expertise in uh, what to look for for consultants uh, in doing this kind of work. So the cost, um, we recommend, oh, sorry. Can you minimize your Zoom? I, did, I just so we can uh, actually see the PowerPoint. I, I just texted our IT director to do that. Yeah, you, you want to maybe add the little um, small arrow that was missing? I just asked. Okay. I'm assuming he's running. He is. Okay. On that very top left, if you click back on your screen on your PowerPoint, well, with the mouse, if you hover over them. 
Adam, you put Oh, me? Yeah. Go on your PowerPoint again with the mouse. Uh, this is not. Yeah. Maybe I, I don't have this Nick? Yeah. Nick? Yeah, yeah. Neil needs to switch uh, the primary. Yeah. yeah, it went really hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice and easy. Yeah. 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 Sorry, it's a little laggy. No problem. Okay, so um, the so as we were saying, the um, the cost we estimate between twenty and thirty thousand. It's going to depend a little bit on the how we administer the survey. We recommend digitally and in person. Uh, we specifically said in person because that's going to be a way of gathering opinions and voices from people not just that are living in Mount Lebanon, but people who work in Mount Lebanon, people who come to Mount Lebanon for restaurants, people who come to Mount Lebanon at all. Those are, will be, there'll be a chance to gauge that. And while that's not necessarily the, uh, gonna be, you know, the focus, we, we aren't gonna say that we're gonna be able to uh, survey every single person who works in Mount Lebanon, we do wanna try to get those voices in as well. So in the potential for mail survey, that, that will account for some of the uh, fluctuation of the cost based on um, as you see in that, you know, the commissioner can see in the full recommendation, the, um, the, that will add at about $11,500 to the cost of uh, whatever we do to actually mail surveys to everybody. And uh, we wanted to provide a few examples uh, of some of the questions that we had talked about. And we should point out these are very much examples um, and that we hope that the whoever is going to be conducting the survey uh, for us will be able to help us hone in on what the uh, on the sentiment behind uh, these questions and help us to uh, understand how to most efficiently gauge the kind of things that we are engaging. But this is just to point out that this really is a comprehensive survey. Uh, you see the questions about policing there. The uh, the group that worked well on the policing um, uh, group had a recommendation for policing that we wholeheartedly agree with and. We'll, we've included all of their recommendations. This is just a small sampling um, of what some of the questions that they had, uh, they had uh, offered. So, and really, I think overall, this survey is just a really a chance for Mount Lebanon to be seen as a thought leader in this space. This is not is something that all municipalities are doing. In fact, very few municipalities are conducting these kinds of surveys. And I think it's really a chance for Mount Lebanon to show their commitment to DEI and, and to really be a leader in this space, both locally, both regionally, and across the country. All right. All right. On to our next. Um, and do you want to take questions oh, on the we survey do, we right survey. now? I didn't know if we were or do you want to take them at the end? Or, what, um, happy to do either, happy to do either yeah. one. Yeah, I have one question. Yeah, maybe as we go, just because it's, sure. it's fresh. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sure. No, I would like to know when you talk about underrepresented groups. Yeah. What's your definition of underrepresented groups? We're going to be working with the um, with the consultant to strictly define that, but essentially groups that um, many of the groups that Mindy had mentioned uh, earlier from uh, the from uh, racial backgrounds, from economic backgrounds, from LGBTQ uh, backgrounds, the um, it's going to be we're going to uh, assess that with the consultant to, uh, to uh, is to make sure that we are the um, providing in the perspective of everyone. Okay. So there is no community input as to what these underrepresented groups could, other than through the working group here, uh, who these groups could be. So it's coming from the outside. Somebody from the outside is telling what the underrepresented groups are. Well, we also, um, one of the uh, recommendations uh, that's going to be followed up with this, and the person who would be conceivably running this survey would be the DEI officer that we're recommending hiring. And we had written that person being the lead on design, on working with the consultants. And this person will be community vetted? This person will be hired by the uh, municipality. With input from the community, that I that one beyond my uh, paper. Yeah, if we have a recommendation that we continue to have specific groups made up of the various DEI members who might be working with these uh, various consultants, so there continues to be input of the forty volunteers who might be focused on different areas that best fit um, their interests and their expertise, et cetera. So that's 
another recommendation to council that the commissioners. I just had one question about the mail survey, which seems to add a lot to the cost. Is yeah. that it, it had there been any thought to having kiosks and various um, municipal buildings or the library where someone could come and take the survey who may not have access to electronic? The, I, we had talked about that, um, I think, with the uh, with the library and having that be something that uh, that we can do. Yeah, with that, that's that definitely an option. That would not be something uh, that we anticipate being particularly uh, much be much less much less uh, expensive than the mailing option. Yeah. I have a question. Was there any thought in other languages that the survey would be offered in? Yes, we're actually in a process right now. We haven't heard back yet, but um, we had talked to the, um, we started with talking with the ESL teachers at Mount Lebanon to, under, uh, to understand what languages, what the predominant languages, languages. Are being spoken, yeah. so what, what we would need. But yes, we would anticipate that being something that uh, we would hopefully want translated into. As yeah. many languages as are relevant. That language. research would be very helpful, yeah, to know yeah. what languages to prioritize. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two surveys? No, one the, survey. Well, no, but it, the recommendation said, said a follow up survey. Right? The follow up survey is meant to be the, the three, three years. years. Yeah, every three years. Oh, I saw the frequency twice every. Okay. Um, so every three years going forward? Yes. Is there another comment? Yeah, I would like to uh, follow up on this uh, underrepresented group. So, for example, a large body, and I just worked with the um, school district on, uh, and that we're trying to do a similar thing uh, with the DI task force for the school district. And uh, who is considering all these young people that are traditionally not in these surveys? Have you considered including students? Have you considered not just residents? You were just talking residents. How about teachers that are not residents here? How about people that are working here but are not residents that are also a very important part? How do you expect to reach those? They don't have a voice, but they're also very important. I think that's an, an, another important consideration that you should bring into these groups to define your target audience for the survey. And I'm happy to help. That's, um, yeah, that's what I was just going to ask. Would you mind maybe writing up or sending that over email, or is there a contact we can get you that yes. you to provide? You know, just yes, uh, I, put, um, I can give that to you right now. Or, or right yeah, now. or maybe you want to be pointed on the survey, the sure. first presenter still, because the recommendations will probably be refined based on the feedback that we're giving right now. Sure. Um, any other commissioner questions or thoughts on the survey piece? <laughs> Um, my only question was, is how many volunteer, resident volunteers, was there an, I, um, an, a thought put into how many resident volunteers would be involved with the consultant and the municipality in executing the survey? The, well, we had, we had talked about having about six to eight people, okay. and that was just like one to two from each group, and then adding on uh, however many, uh, opening up again, again, to see if, because since the surveying was not part of the original charge of uh, the group that we put together, I think there may be a chance to get more perspectives in that have that kind of expertise in it. Yeah, that makes sense. Great. Should we move on to the next recommendation? Thanks. Okay. Uh, so the next recommendation that we have, um, as you know, all four groups have made recommendations at this point. Um, and we you know, considered a number of proposals. We're creating a number of proposals. Uh, we feel like this is quite a lot of work in the coming years. And so we suggest that um, Mount Lebanon open up a DEI uh, department with a officer, DEI officer, that could sustain the effort necessary to really make some lasting change. Um, so this is a staff position that would implement many of the recommendations from all four groups. No doubt there would be volunteers involved, but this person would oversee and coordinate many of these efforts. Um, there is, um, there are communities in the United States of similar size that have done similar things. Uh, most recently, I looked at um, Arlington, which is uh, Massachusetts, which is west of um, Boston, and they actually hired a DEI officer. And you can read about it on your on their website, for example. Uh, but they would oversee quite a few of the recommendations that we suggest. And, um, we do suggest that this person is hired early in the process in 2022, so that they are here from the get-go. Uh, to start some of these initiatives 
and we did give um, we did research and get some salary information because I know that was a, you know something that you would want to know. Um, so that's from salary.com. Um, but we do have um, so Rebecca Diaz, who is an expert in this field, who could also weigh in if you have more specific questions on that. Was the salary.com number total comp, like including insurance, or is that just the regular salary that would probably be posted? I believe it is just the regular yeah, probably. salary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was just a, it was kind of a ballpark. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any questions or anything? Should, should I move on to the next one? Um, but yeah, just oh. what, what department did you see that position in? We we actually thought that it should be an independent department okay. so that it had parity with all the other departments and could talk with all department heads. Okay, thanks. Um, the next uh, piece is actually something that Rebecca Diaz put together. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go over the slide because I know we have a time constraint and then we can ask specific questions of Rebecca. Uh, so the phrase implicit bias is actually um, refers to those biases that we all have, but we are unaware of. Um, these are not things that make us bad um, or reflect any part of our character. They're simply uh, things that we have in our head that affect the way we deal with um, everyday life. So what we suggest is that we have some bias training to explore these blind spots that are, you know, impacting our decision making. Um, Diaz Consulting actually gave us a cost estimate to do this work. Um, and what uh, Rebecca suggests is um, micro sessions that are kind of woven into the community, maybe at the library, in other public spaces, maybe even at the farmer's market or some kind of outdoor event, just a table. Um, where people can come in and do quick activities and sort of gain some insight into their own biases. Uh, community partners could include the library, the school district, um, and some of the outdoor events. Um, we do see that while the initial um, effort would be from a consulting firm, um, there would be trained volunteers that would then take over some of the implementation after initial uh, of the initial point. Of, of uh, getting the program together. Questions? No, the 3,000, any idea how many hours of training that equates to? Um, I'm going to refer to Rebecca, who is actually online. I know you guys you just know that she's there. Yeah. I am here. Hi. Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? You sound, good. You sound great. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, yes. So the the hours basically will we'll take it, the estimate that I, that was given will, from my consultancy in any respects will be whatever the hours take for the volunteers. So if we're looking here at a training session that lasts between an hour to three hours, depending on the volunteer groups that are there, it's very minimal training to kind of understand how to collectively oversee these different kinds of micro sessions and events. Um, and once it's established, it kind of will run itself. And we're also thinking here of things that are freestanding, um, art displays that are perhaps set up, uh, different kinds of visual elements that can be witnessed in conjunction with other things that are already established. And so that doesn't have to be a very heavy lift in that respect. Okay, so the 3,000 is training volunteers and plus maybe some visual support. That makes sense. Right. All encompassing for anything that would be needed. Yeah. And training. Um, yes. Scalable. Mm -hmm. scalable. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah, um, yeah, quick audience question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry that I, I wasn't involved, even though I tried to be involved in the beginning, so you get my message. Yeah. But uh, the question is, who decides on the consulting agency? Because that's an important question too. We have a lot of local nonprofits that are heavily involved and invested in this work. I mean, yeah, the and, municipality would send out a, a formal RFP right, and I then it advertise. Should be, it should be, and you know, mm -hmm. this I see this just as a potential here and a, uh, an example of what it could cost as an orientation, but I think it should be open and especially nonprofits that are representing the community, and I mean community, the underrepresented community, should be given preference before any commercial. Yeah, that's a great, agency. yeah, that's a great point for the public. I really appreciate you bringing that up. The municipality would not engage with Diaz Consulting by de facto, um, even though we have mm -hmm. used their services in the past for internal unbiased training. I personally took it and highly recommend it, but we would not ever de facto just engage with one consultant. We would send out a formal RFP. There would be transparency in that process and anyone could bid on that. Um, open to the public. And there are different subgroups of minorities too, of underrepresented groups that have more spe specific 
knowledge as to how to represent these yeah. groups and what they need. And I know this is a lot of information, but we can't take a lot of public questions. Otherwise, we okay. won't get through the presentations today. Okay. Um, but I do apologize. There is a, there yeah. will be an opportunity during the regular meeting for public comment of five minutes, and you can you can attend those at any time and make comment on anything, including this. Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to move to the next recommendation. Um, so the next recommendation we had um, was regarding anti-racism training. Um, and uh, we recommend that to engage with Dr. Uh, Allie Michael, and she's a 1996 graduate of Mount Lebanon. So she knows our community really, really well. She's also a nationally recognized anti-racism trainer. Um, and we propose that she is invited to do a series of trainings here at Mount Lebanon. Um, we proposed her at Mount Lebanon High School. Um, but what she does, she focuses on racial competence. So she describes this as having the skills and the confidence to engage in healthy and reciprocal cross-racial relationships. So Dr. Michael would work with residents, educators, and community-based organizations in the area. Um, some more details and specific recommendations. Um, we would recommend that this happen right around January 15th to 17th to coincide with uh, Martin Luther King Day. Um, and this involves several targeted workshops. So maybe uh, one specific workshop for educators, another one for faith communities, et cetera. We also would like a large talk uh, at the high school for our, our public, uh, for our regular audience. Um, so there are several organizations already on the ground who are ready to co-sponsor the event. The cost of the event would likely be in the eight to 10,000 range, but um, we are only asking for $3,000 in contribution for this because others are willing to take up the rest of it. Um, and we, of course, um, you know, would like interested DEI committee members to continue to coordinate this effort. How does this compare to the cost of the Tulsa race massacre? Do we know? Event. Yeah, event. event. Well, I'm sure that came in. Dr. DiNardo. Which is actually on. on yeah. Here and maybe he can fill us in. The um, it's my understanding that the uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. 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 Okay. It's my understanding that the uh, total cost when you add in the um, travel, the hotel stay, was probably close to about seven thousand for the Tulsa uh, presentation. Um, so this one probably, you know, when you get sort of three different area events i guess would pro even though it's more expensive would be you know a little bit better there that's very helpful things that we've done in the past any questions or comments on that recommendation proposition okay next okay. thank you all right so the next area of focus we'd like to focus on is disability rights um, oh, for whatever reason, that's lagging and we cannot see the slides. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, I'm going to look at my slide in the mm -hmm. time. So um, we are recommending that Disability Awareness Month be highlighted annually. Um, there's two months, but, you know, March is really Disability Awareness Month in the United States. Um, and that this address um, all disabilities of different forms, including those that are visible and those that are hidden. Um, the goal of this recommendation is uh, through awareness and knowledge of legislation to empower our disabled neighbors to get equal access to resources and feel a sense of belonging in Mount Lebanon. So the first specific recommendation is a community viewing of the film Crip Camp in 2022. We did investigate this is on Netflix and I contacted them. Um, this can be done with no no additional charge. We uh, there's no charge for this. Can you hold on just one second? Yeah. Can I ask IT to try to find the slide on? Um, there is. Okay. Oh, there Thank go. you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um, so uh, viewing of the film Crip Camp with a follow up discussion. For those of you who are not familiar with Crip Camp, this is um, a film about Camp Jamed, which was a camp that took place in the 1970s for those who were disabled and. A lot of the disability rights that we know today came from the folks who attended that camp. It's a really, really moving film. It changed my view of, of all of this. So it, I think that this would be, I highly recommend this film. Um, and then followed by a discussion. 
Um, and then, of course, um, after that, we suggest um, a presentation by uh, Dr. Ruth Holker. Um, she is actually an attorney and a, a disability rights advocate. She's also a professor at Ohio State, and she could actually inform us better about disability law. Um, the time frame for this um, event or these events would be spring of 2022. Um, and again, we have a, a cost estimate if we're having Ruth Holker come and give her presentation below. Um, we do see disability rights as highlighted annually with some sort of event. Questions? Um, what, what's the long-term way that that would be maintained? Would the, would you recommend the DEI um, staff person be in charge of the event coordination? And obviously it's a large resident volunteer as well arm, but. Correct, so that would be something that the DEI officer could take on and plan something specifically every year to sort of highlight. Yeah. And you know, there's many disabilities that are actually not visible. There's also hidden disabilities, and I think people don't know enough about them. So, yeah. okay. thank you. Move on to the next. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, I think so. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. The next uh, recommendation we have is um, actually a recommendation uh, to join a Welcoming America. Now, Welcoming America is a nonprofit um, that is leading a movement uh, to form inclusive communities. Um, and this is, you know, by ensuring that everyone belongs to a community, including those who are new to our community, the immigrants. Um, there are very specific, uh, it's a very specific framework uh, in the Welcome America standard. Um, so it's almost like a playbook that the, a community can go through um, to sort of get the certified status. Um, the certified welcoming is a formal designation. So it really means that cities and counties have actually created policies and programs that demonstrate a commitment to immigrant inclusion. So Allegheny County is already a welcoming America County and the city of Pittsburgh is certified welcoming. So we have, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we have neighbors who can actually uh, inform our, 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 our process. That's great, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it always helps. Um, so what we recommend is kind of a two-step process. So the first step would be to join Welcoming the Welcoming America Network at the initial step. Um, that thankfully is the less expensive step. Um, and then we follow up in a couple of years with becoming certified welcoming. Um, this does require, again, a municipal employee to really spearhead the process. They don't work with volunteers, but rather with a point person in the municipality. So this, again, would be the DEI officer. Um, and uh, so we recommend that, you know, in 2022 that we just join the welcoming network and then become certified by 2023. So the cost of just joining the network ranges from uh, $200 to $2,500. There's three different tiers um, and each tier has like, you know, benefits that associate with them. So that's the initial. Um, and then the cost for actually becoming certified welcoming is in the $6,000 to $12,000 range. Um, there's some discounts going on at this time, but I'm not sure how long that's going to last. The $1,500 fee that one pays to actually join the Welcoming Network will actually go towards that, the whole cost. So that's not duplicative. That's six to 12,000. Is there, I mean, how the, that seems like that rather mean? large range. What is their by population? How does that work out? That's a great question. And we have Anne Michelle, who I believe is on, or she was. Um, and she's done a little yes. bit more. Yes. yes. I'm ahead, here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Clear. Okay. Um, so currently there's a discount of $6,000 instead of the full price of $12,000. Um, wow. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure how long the discount will last. Um, so that's, that's what the price differential is there. Okay, thank you. And, and Michelle, do you have any idea for the first level, the Welcoming of America, that's um, at most 2,500, how much, how many hours would that take um, from the municipal staff person? I'm sorry, which level were you asking? Oh, uh, the first one, the Welcoming America that costs up to $2,500, the one that's recommended for 2022, the immediate recommendation. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that is divided into three different membership levels. Okay. Depending on depending on what the municipality would see as most beneficial um, for our purposes, um, 
and obviously the higher you go in um, membership, there's general core and premium. And then depending on which one you choose, there's different levels of um, support and assistance and feedback that the Welcoming America Network team would give the municipality. And so I don't have a specific answer in terms of how many like work hours it would require of the DEI professional um, at this time. This is very helpful though. It's very helpful to have something to kind of plug into as well. I think, um, especially since we're starting out, we're so new, we're prone to making a lot of mistakes to have something local that we can tap into. It's really encouraging to have that support. I'm sure they can support us in other areas of our DEI initiatives as well, or at least, um, you know, we don't have to be a network. Okay. Um, the next recommendation. I have to ask. You, I have to okay. go back because I just realized the person doing the anti-racism training is white, and not saying that white per se disqualifies. But I request that the commission considers a person of color or other minority to do the anti-racism training. I mean, this is an insult to a lot of the minority community members, especially if we go public and press, this is a debacle to bring up a yeah. white. I white believe, person. yeah, I believe group one put a lot of thought into that recommendation and I want them to be able to comment on it. I also want them to be able to get through the rest of their recommendations. So maybe we could save it to the end. Sure. And then if there's time before 7.15, we could have um, Pete Denardo, whoever was point on that kind of respond to that. I, I understand that concern as well. I know that they did. Heavily, heavily considered. <laughs> May I go? To yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. Um, so the next uh, recommendation that we have, and this is really a few recommendations wrapped into one, is to just make DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, just a general part of our community. Um, so we just need to fold DEI into regular life here at Mount Lebanon. So one of the uh, recommendations will be to just include some information tables representing various DEI groups in the South Hills at scheduled our, our regular events, whether it be First Fridays, whether it be our farmers markets, just events that already go on here in Mount Lebanon. Um, the goal is really to educate people about DEI work and maybe gain some volunteers along the way. Um, we also recommend that we look into um, some of the stuff, it's, uh, publications and things such as the Mount Lebanon Magazine, um, and the clubs that are listed on our website to just make sure that they're just a little bit more reflective of the community. I know we've already spoken to Laura on his Lily about this and she's very supportive of that. Um, so we, you know, we would update the club section, for instance, the website to just, you know, uh, reflect our broader interest as we move forward. Um, again, this would be coordinated by the DEI officer with help from volunteers and, uh, Beyond the rental fees for some tables and such like that, this is not a huge, um, it's not a costly endeavor in there by any means. Um, and this really holds up the last, so this, you know, this really holds up the last three of our recommendations. There were a couple of them folded into one. And so we um, are open to questions and clarifications if anyone has them. And thanks for the opportunity, uh, really, for doing this work and for presenting. I have a quick question. So, of course. Um, there was mention of, you mentioned the magazine and you spoke to Laura about that. There was mention of things like partnering with My Brother's Keeper, um, cross community service projects, things like uh, cooking classes, that would all be rolled up into what you just presented as make EI part of the community. Yes, and okay. you know, that was part of the initial recommendations that came after talking to commissioners and everything. We sort of, um, we focused on certain areas for this initial process, but we could certainly see some of that coming up in the future once things got established. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and on that, on the club's um, recommendation, I saw that, uh, yeah, well, maybe the last slide, of probably yeah. too hard. Oh, magic, look at that. Yeah. Um, so was there some criteria that group one has for how to recommend a club on our website or what, how we should? Um, them, what they should do, you know, do they need to be a nonprofit, for example? Um, do they need to serve Mount Lebanon? Do they need to be incorporated in Mount Lebanon as a nonprofit? Right, and I'm going to actually see if um, Margaret could give us some perspective on this. And I knew we're part right. of uh, Yeah, they definitely do not need to be incorporated in Mount Lebanon. Now, we reached out to the broader community. You know, we would initially look at the South Hills, see if there's a South Hills entity representing underrepresented groups. 
And also to the extent that there isn't, or maybe they're not that active, we're reaching out to the entire community because I think it's necessary that Mount Lebanon as a whole sees examples of diverse groups out there that they can join. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is a list as attachment D. Yeah. And then would you, would, you, would you advise to stay away from faith-based organizations or not necessarily? Yes, you need to stay away from okay. faith-based based on information we had from the outside council. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And David Binder was actually here from our group also um, did like an initial sort of meeting of groups and it was actually very, people were very eager to meet and kind of share information. So we think it will be successful. Thank you. you said outside council. Um, the, the legal counsel that met with us back in February. And they advised what? That basically, oh. you, as a municipality, you need to stay content neutral. So having uh, religious or political groups uh, could invalidate the content neutrality, which is necessarily for a municipal entity. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for getting that legal advice. <laughs> Saves us the trouble. Um, any more questions about this last DEI part of the community from the commission or thoughts? Um, I, I, I think I might have suggested this earlier, but we have so many wonderful advisory boards and um, nonprofits such as the Mount Lebanon Partnership, the Historical Society. They're all very eager to increase their diversity and to become more DEI aware. So any outreach that um, any, any structured outreach to those groups would be appreciated by those groups, even if it's just as simple as kind of attending one of their meetings and having an informal conversation. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on any part of our presentation? Um, no, we, no, go ahead. We can take, yeah, we can take um, the question on the speaker for the anti-racism allyship recommendation. Does, um, Anyone from group one want to take it? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just, just as, May I speak to that? Yeah, just, May I speak know, to that? Hold on one second, Pete. Yeah, I just wanted to say these are recommendations. So the commission, staff, legal, we have a lot of work to do still in reviewing these. So what you see here is not necessarily what moves forward. Some of this stuff may not move forward in any way, shape, or form. And some may be pushed off. And there's a lot of conversation we have to have still so there's going to be more thought that goes into this. We'll have to get back to the groups and maybe you know massage things in terms of how this all works out. So just to make sure that people understand what's being proposed here is not something that's going to happen next week. And a lot of the questions are going to be how, like who would do yeah, this? Yeah, there's a lot of work. You know, where's the staff so. capacity? How do we do it? Um, what's the structure so that we're successful? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, well, go ahead. Oh. Pete, go ahead. So perhaps that the comment, the person who made the comment uh, didn't uh, see the slide or didn't hear, but um, we would not be so obtuse to, to not recognize that persons of color on an anti-racism. But if you see the slide, it's a white anti-racism allyship. It is particularly geared primarily to white people. So in this case, I don't think the speaker's observation applies as much. It is, Ali is an expert in this and she includes people of color, but um, the focus is to work with white folks to become allies to causes of justice. And there are other forms of anti-racism education that that issue would be more germane. But for this one, I, I, don't, I don't believe it is. More questions or comments from the commission or the municipal staff on group one. Yes. Uh, can we go back to that slide where we have rejection another expert uh, that is partially funded by a faith based organization? Did I see that correctly? I'm not sure which slide you're referring to. Uh, can you, uh, I think it was the I next one. A, no. Uh, or it's no, the one prior to it, I think. Where a part it, of the funding comes it, from. It's the white anti racism allyship. It is St. Paul's Episcopal. And so there, it's partially founded by a faith based organization. You just make the statement that we cannot enroll faith based organization otherwise, from a legal perspective. How can we involve that in this case and have them co sponsor kind of co employees with the community in this sense and not run legal trouble? A um, couple of years ago, after, uh, Dan Miller set up a couple of things and, and the Commission of Frost was involved. Wasn't that at St. Paul? Yes. I thought it was. That was a great event. That was run by a, that was run by a consultant. I don't know if St. Paul's is involved in funding that, but 
they housed it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's all, all of the recommendations will have to be vetted by legal. Yeah, so that's, yeah. again, these are not final recommendations. Yeah. We're listening and we'll consult with council and I'm sure he's listening as well. Phil, do you want to comment now even um, on that in general? Yes, I think you're hitting on the right issues. Um, content neutral, contracting rules. We have a lot of the legal analysis will come into detail for now. Okay. Just wanted to raise this. Yeah, thank you for the questions. I think I mean, we're at 7 15. I thank you for all the questions. Wow. Wow. What is it like? Oh, fantastic work that you've done over the last nine months. Really, thank you all, all the members of Group One, for the tremendous amount of research that you put in. I know there was a lot of work up front in, um, in getting alignment and getting to know each other and trust each other and then so much so many hours of research collaboration subcommittees um, to get us to this point so for just being around for nine ten months this is fantastic <laughs> thank you